But I want to emphasize basically the human side of what we're all trying to do and how, you know, on the one hand, it's, it's a huge challenge and it's difficult at a personal level in many different dimensions orienting our lives around such ambitious goals as transforming to sustainable, green, inclusive pathways to development. But just last week, we had one of the world's many inspiring people here, President Alvarado from Costa Rica. And I bring him up because of two things. Um, basically, they, the country, first of all, has driven many transformations. One of the first countries in the world to abolish the military, a country that had very early universal health care, very early universal education for girls and for boys, and a country that recently, when I started working there in the 1990s, had the highest deforestation rate in the world in history. And yet it turned around and now has one of the highest reforestation rates anywhere in the world. It's also a country that last week, um, <clears throat> a, a whole team came here to announce again the goal of becoming the world's first or maybe with a group decarbonized nation, switching completely away from fossil fuels and inviting people in Silicon Valley here in our universities to engage in driving the research um, and all of the other, the investment and other parts of transformation that are necessary to lead the world, hopefully with a whole um, large group, ever-growing group of countries to achieve that change. <clears throat> so it was incredibly inspiring and hearing him talk and thinking about the arc that we are all a part of the people um, who've given to this cause for a long time that we're now carrying forward um, is what I wanted to get into. And just emphasizing how from those maybe earlier times and going much further back, we've had tremendous individuals that we're all connected to in some way. I'm just going to highlight a couple here um, <clears throat> leading the path. One key person was Ken Arrow. He's um, at one level kind of intimidating. A Nobel Prize in economics. About five of his students, I think, got the Nobel Prize in economics as well. And yet he was the kindest person, always out, just listening to others, helping others make their lives, and seeing the fun in it all. So here he is. A lot of his work was done with the team in Stockholm. Here he is with Carl Folke, who many of you know, learning one of the Swedish drinking songs just a couple years ago at another meeting, driving research innovation to achieve sustainable development. And Kalle is telling him, you've got to bang your head on the table really hard, like that. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm just bringing him in, bringing other heroes in our midst. Hal Mooney will be joining us um, for much of the symposium, and Hal, you know, um, <clears throat> has been crucial in driving innovation that brings together science and world leaders, um, setting up the Global Biodiversity Assessment, one of the first global environmental assessments, uh, leading after that to the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, you know, involving all countries and thousands of scientists and really making policy impact, and now setting up you know, the analog to the IPCC, the IPBES, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, just working tirelessly. And yet, I could hardly find that picture of him alone. I got it off of the internet. All the images I could find with him have him together with many other leaders, um, <clears throat> bringing people in understanding one another, here with Jane Lubchenco, here with um, Jose Sarukang in Mexico, who, by the way, set up a natural capital project in Mexico by chance the same year with the same name as um, this natural capital project that we're all together um, for this week. So 
with these inspiring people, let's think about what we're, what we're aiming to do together. Um, <clears throat> driving the Knowledge Foundation, you know, there was a question, would we ever put knowledge into action? And it was with great excitement, actually, that some of the early pioneering cases of putting knowledge into action um, came to the forefront. So on the left with Costa Rica's policy, paying people, incentivizing people to conserve and restore forest for a whole suite of benefits for climate security, for aspects of water security and energy security um, <clears throat> to help um, deliver hydropower, for example, um, biodiversity and health, um, ecotourism. There were many dimensions of that program bringing the importance of our science home to people worried about all these other aspects of life and not thinking that much about biodiversity or, or ecosystems as the fundamental assets that we um, depend on for our well-being. And China, launching in the late 1990s, the largest payment system in the entire world, with today something like 200 million people being paid to restore ecosystems. And then New York City <clears throat> became um, also a really inspiring case when the city in modern times you know, decided to, instead of investing in a water filtration plant, to invest in ecosystem restoration, in better management practices among farmers and foresters and communities in the area where the water for the city um, originates <clears throat> in order to secure health and water supply. So these cases, everybody worried then that we would be paused on these cases. There were not many more coming in the early moments, but today that's, that's changed again. There, there are thousands of cases emerging in many parts of the world thanks to the work of everyone here and many, many others. And the ambition then became, <clears throat> by 2006, to start systematizing an approach that we could apply better in our globalized world all over the place. So not meaning the exact same thing everywhere, but a common language to talk to one another. So countries could talk to one another about how we value nature in human development and a common framework and a, a way of approaching the problem that involved an acceleration and more ambitious science and other research and implementation goals. So what we've really come to develop together through the Natural Capital Project is an approach that involves engaging <clears throat> the scientists, the technology leaders, and the real world people driving implementation, opening opportunity to change policy, change finance, change our culture, change our way of thinking. So we've come today now to have a huge group, an ever-building group of research institutions working very intimately together with <clears throat> implementing institutions all over the world so that the loop between the ideas in these different realms is really, really tight. And so like Ken Arrow and Hal Mooney, we're having a lot of fun along the way. And our work together involves setting up these powerful demonstrations, ever grander in their goals, in new places, geographically, and in new contexts, different policy or finance, and other contexts to drive change. Um, and in the course of doing all this, to build up the capacity of people worldwide to advance this mission and to keep innovating and do things we're not even imagining today. Building especially <clears throat> this platform that has data, making you know, global environmental data, making all of this um, much more accessible and feasible for people to use, and new software that relates human well-being to the conditions, the processes out in kind of um, across the planet in um, a lot of different contexts of ecosystems. So 
relating this, you know, developing the science to let us know how to achieve coastal protection in the face of climate change, where and how much to invest in ecosystem conservation or restoration, or how to engage people in food production in cities and in other um, places to secure one of humanity's most important activities. And across a whole suite of realms, trying to quantify <clears throat> excuse me, what the return on investment will be in nature to achieve our goals of leaving a, a better planet for our kids and grandkids. All of this packaged up into the software that you know well, Invest, and um, now used ever more widely around the world to um, drive this change, leading today to really trying to mainstream and scale this up, and that's what this um, gathering is about. We have incredible leaders coming together in major institutions that are letting us go beyond single countries and across, often through the multilateral development banks and other more regional and global institutions to drive practices, change in practices that will <clears throat> accelerate the shift that we're beginning to see in um, specific places all over the world. Last year, we had a, a big focus on China, welcoming the Chinese Academy of Sciences um, formally into the lead part of the partnership. And um, this year, we're highlighting Latin America. And it's just a tremendous honor having so many people here from both of those regions and, and many other places, focusing on development planning, <clears throat> um, in large form across countries and regions, and especially also on livable cities. Those will be two major themes for this week. Um, and within those, <clears throat> many other, <clears throat> um, many other realms that we're advancing. Thinking especially um, about our new um, <clears throat> software that will that's now in sort of testing form, allowing um, sort of in, us to inform leaders in cities of what the return on investment would be in green space, in adding green space to promoting a wide range of benefits in um, transforming cities to livable, unsustainable places. I, <clears throat> last year in welcoming the Chinese, we had an incredible performance in the Bing Concert Hall on Tuesday night. <clears throat> and we're going to be um, featuring this year a really special surprise performance, so no pictures yet, uh, from Latin America. So I, I really hope you can make the evening tomorrow night in the Bing Concert Hall. Um, we'll be starting at 7.15 with uh, doors open and the main um, presentation by Rodolfo Dierso, a leader here from Latin America, and um, <clears throat> a real tour of culture and music. <clears throat> and now finally, what I'd love to do is welcome the core partners up here, starting with the Stockholm Resilience Center. <clears throat> Jan, come on up, and, and everybody else, please, from the University of Minnesota, from the Chinese Academy of Sciences, from the Nature Conservancy from World Wildlife Fund, and welcome everybody to give just a brief remark on um, what the partnership means and hopefully how you're uh, awake and ready to go. Much better form than I. <laughs> yes, can I start? Please, I'll stand to the side. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, the Stockholm Resilience Center is an international center of excellence for resilience and sustainability science. It's a joint initiative uh, between Stockholm University and the uh, Bayer Institute of Ecological Economics at the Swedish uh, Royal Academy of Science. And the mission is uh, to advance research for management and governance um, of the human dominated biosphere to secure the ecosystem services for human well-being and resilience for long-term sustainability. Since the launch in 2007, uh, we've developed into a world-leading institute for addressing the 
the complex challenges of the Anthropocene. And since the very beginning, we've done so in close collaboration with the uh, partners here at the Natural Capital Project. And thanks to the Wallenberry Foundation, uh, we've been able to deepen this friendship and really explore the synergies of working together as partnerships. So it's a great honor to be here today and to celebrate with all of you here that the uh, Stockholm Resilience Center and Bayer Institute will become official partners here at the Natural Capital Project. Good morning, I'm Steve Pulaski from the University of Minnesota. And it's really wonderful to have uh, Stockholm uh, Resilience Center as part of the, uh, part of the official family. It's a, uh, we, we are growing our circle of friends and influence and it's really wonderful to have, have you involved. Um, University of Minnesota, we've been a uh, partner for quite a while now um, and um, we work with all of the uh, different groups. So with, uh, with Stockholm and uh, China and TNC and WWF, and of course, uh, with Stanford as well. Um, one announcement, uh, we have a new associate director at the Institute on the Environment. So the Natural Capital Project is housed at the Institute on the Environment at the University of Minnesota. Um, and we have Melissa Kenny, who is here. Yes, right there. Um, so Melissa Kenny is the new uh, associate director for research at the Institute on the Environment, and she will be uh, instrumental going forward in, in working with NatCap. So welcome, Melissa. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Seema Paul, and I'm representing the Nature Conservancy. Uh, we work, uh, the Nature Conservancy works in 70 countries around the world. We are a do tank. We work on the ground and then leveraging that on the ground experience, we uh, bridge the conservation landscape with decision makers, both in policy circles as well as in business circles. Uh, we are very proud of our partnership with NatCap. It has been going on since its founding, I believe. And uh, NatCap is also very science-led and it's backed by the equity of uh, Stanford's uh, brand, uh, but the robustness of its tools and outputs and its engagement process with decision makers not only ensures that it um, gets to the table with decision makers, it also ensures that their interest is sustained and uh, decisions are actually taken based on good science and good tools. Um, and that's the reason why we look forward to strengthening this partnership um, and building on it. I think uh, the challenges of people and nature broke no um, delays. And it's very important for all of us to come together and sustain the partnership. And in that vein, I'm also very excited that we have new partners in the fold. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am Nirmal Bhagavati from the World Wildlife Fund, uh, or WWF. Uh, I'm based in Washington, DC, but uh, as many of you uh, likely know, we are a global organization as well. And it has been a real privilege and a joy to be associated with the Natural Capital Project. Uh, we've been core partners with them uh, right from the get-go. And, uh, uh, and we've just had an amazing partnership, whether it is uh, helping uh, in driving our field conservation around the world in Asia, Africa, Latin America, the Arctic, and elsewhere, uh, in terms of mainstreaming natural capital into policy and into finance, and now, now more recently into infrastructure, financing, and standards. And there's so much more I could go on about. But most of all, I think it's just been wonderful to work with such a great group of colleagues. You know, These are some of the smartest and most driven people I've ever had the privilege to work with, but at the same time, also some of the kindest and most warm-hearted and joyful people that I've ever met in or outside of science. So I think you're all in for a real treat. You know, learn, share, grow, but most of all, have fun while doing all that. So thank you very much and welcome. Hi, 
Good morning, everybody. I'm Fa Zhen from Chinese Academy of Sciences. And, and uh, we're glad to meet you in Stanford. And Chinese Academy of Sciences is trying to uh, push the transformation of green and inclusive uh, growth in China. During the process, natural capital project uh, the partnership not only provided the important institution to provide the um, uh, technological, theoretical support in China and to implant in, in the uh, important concept, they um, try to uh, put the uh, slash waters and the large mountains is the invaluable assets in China. And then, but also provide the uh, open a window for us to exchange the uh, successful actions in China to push the frontiers in, in, in the world. So um, uh, we also hope to, to work together with you to push the frontier in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Welcome again, warmest welcome.